let me remind all those who are listening, it's Valentine Day. And uh, if you haven't gotten that card yet, I, I think they may be picked over, Alex. I hope you've already uh, taken care of that, brother. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> Um, and gave my Valentine uh, a Valentine this morning, and she gave me one as well. But well, we, um, I've bought mine, but I'm going to have to wait till I get home and give that to her. We're looking forward to that. But I, Valentine Day is one of those days uh, you just, if you're married, you sure don't want to forget it, do you? No, that's right, because um, if you forget it, uh, you won't forget you it. You won't forget it. <laughs> But, okay, uh, listen, um, I, we could go on a tangent on this one. I could I could tell you about uh, giving a card to my wife uh, two years in a row. The, it wasn't the same card, but they looked just alike. And I told her, I said, that mean, that really means I really mean you're my Valentine. Amen. But, uh, so anyway, amen. Uh, there's well, we're, a we're lot blessed. of learning there. Well, you know, um, so much of the Bible um, has contributed to our speech. And, um, you know, I think that... Um, you can't even really understand life, the, the Western world, the English language, without having a handle on the Bible. And the, the phrase, um, uh, plucked out of the fire, a, a, a firebrand, plucked out of the flame, you've heard variations on that saying, haven't you? Yes, yes. And, and this is one of those um, sayings that comes from the pages of Scripture. And, Bert, I, I think it doesn't refer only to Joshua, the high priest here. He was high priest when this remnant comes back from exile, and it was under this remnant that Haggai was saying, hey, rebuild the temple. And probably the temple um, they started in maybe 521 or 520 and possibly finished about 516 or 515. But uh, not only Joshua, the high priest, was the, the brand plucked from the fire uh, from the oppression of Satan. I really think that Judah, this tiny remnant that, I mean, almost got extinguished, almost got, um, you know, the whole nation uh, wiped out. The Just Judah, the tribe of Judah was like a, a, a stick plucked out of the fire before it got completely consumed. I, I think you're right. And and this is why the scriptures, I, I believe you and I try to do this as, as well as we can. Those scriptures that have I won't say double meaning, but they have double emphasis on maybe one one era or two eras or one person or two people. And, and it's not just Joshua the high priest. I, I agree with you. It's that remnant, and he's talking, referring to that. And he and and so we find also this courtroom of accusation. It, it even comes across into our lives and 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 making us right and. But the good thing about it is, is that the Lord is in control and he is the one that puts the clean garments upon Joshua, the high priest. Yes. Uh, and, and it says in verse five, let them put a clean turban on his head. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a little bit different. You know, we, most of the time we think about the robe uh, that is consistent all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the book of Revelation. But putting this clean turban on their on his head. Now, I don't know if this is exactly what you had in mind or thought about Alex, but I could not help but think about the armor of God and mm -hmm. the helmet of our salvation. Yeah. In other words, what God does, he, he brings a new thought into, into our life. Christ has not just forgiven me of my sin, but, but as I saturate myself in him and his word, uh, this is what we call the Christian worldview. Uh, yeah. We look at things completely different, don't we? Well, we really do. We really do. And and Joshua, and the, the name Joshua means Jehovah saves. Uh, he was pictorial, and all these priests were, that went before God on behalf of the people, were pictorial of, of Jesus. Now, we're going to see a reference to Jesus. We're going to see a messianic prophecy in just a few verses here in Zechariah chapter 3. But you know, the amazing thing was, and this, this I think was... Uh, would have stretched the imagination of any of the people in that day. Uh, there were all these priests, and then there came Jesus, uh, prophet, king, and priest. But it was so that God would raise up a kingdom of priests. Now, Exodus 19 talks about God uh, making a kingdom of priests, and Romans 1 uh, reiterates that, that um, we can go to God uh, on our own behalf, 
uh, thanks to Jesus, we can go, go to God on behalf of others and pray for people and intercede. But uh, what a, what an amazing thing. And yeah, you mentioned the Galatians, um, you know, uh, walking in the spirit, the Ephesians uh, uh, putting on the armor of God. But here's the thing. When I'm reading about this turban being put on the head of Joshua, it reminds me of the priestly garments mentioned back in the Old Testament of, of what the the priests would wear. You remember all that? Yes, that's true. Yeah. And and so God not only clothes them in righteousness, but putting on this turban is a reference of being being able to come before God as a priest does. And ultimately, as all who know God in salvation can do. Praise the Lord. And with that, he introduces us to the angel of the Lord admonishing Joshua and saying, this is what the Lord of hosts says. If you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my commandments, then you shall also judge my house. Now, I know that's not the whole whole verse, but you have some ifs and some thens there. In other words, there are some things in God's covenant that are conditional. Uh, some are unconditional. He just blesses but some are conditional. And here it seems like if you'll do this and do this, then uh, this will happen. And the rest of the verse says, and likewise have charge on my courts. I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Uh, he's making a pretty strong promise about the, the days of the children of Israel and having Jerusalem and Judah as part of their territory that they'll rule over if they'll do certain things, isn't he? Well, it, that's true. And, and, you know, let me say this. This is not the Joshua that was during the time of Moses, is it? This no, is, it's a different time. And there, there, that was a name that was commonly used. But here's a conditional promise. You know, if you'll walk in my ways, if you'll keep my command, uh, then you'll, you'll judge my house. I'm going to keep my hand upon you and where I'm using you. But, Bert, doesn't this sound uh, so, somewhat similar to um, in Joshua 1.7? Um, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. The, the commands to the Joshua in Zechariah's day sounded very similar yeah. to the commands uh, that, that the first Joshua got. And that, that is neat when you think about it because we're talking about entering the land under Joshua and now we're talking about them re-entering re the land under this Joshua. So mm -hmm. uh, not only the names, but also some of the similarities are different as they enter the land and re-enter the land. So God is, is, is his promises are secure, and, and his character remains the same. And it was true with Joshua the conqueror, but it's also true with Joshua the high priest. Mm-hmm. Um, let me say this to those that are that are maybe in ministry. I know we have a lot of preachers that listen, or maybe you're even serving in a church, or you're in some ministry capacity. Uh, and Bert, you comment here, but let me say I believe ministry is a privilege, not a right. I mean, it it is a privilege. Yes. It is an honor when God opens up an opportunity to serve, and we we can't take it for granted because if if we take it for granted and think that you know, well, maybe I'm I'm smart and I deserve this, and and we get slack and we give God less than a day's work, um, and we begin to think that ministry is some kind of right to which I'm entitled. God can take it away, and and I think God is saying to Joshua here, if you walk in my ways, if you keep my command, then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. You know, I think that this is a little reminder that ministry. And the position that God entrusts to us, uh, it's a privilege, not a right. It really is. And it reminds me of one of our heroes, Vance Havener. He had yep. a sermon. It was home before dark. Yep. And he, when he would preach it to preachers, that's exactly what he would do, Alex. He would admonish the pastors and the preachers to stay faithful to the end. He said there's no time when you let up. There's no time when you drop your guard. You continue to serve the Lord. He, I heard him say, he said, how many ministers along the way, when they get right in later part of their ministry, they kind of, I, I don't know if they relax a little bit or thinking mm -hmm. that they've served the Lord long enough that they're safe. And he says that they drop away. And uh, he said, let's get home before dark. Do not drop your guard. Be faithful to the end. And I think that's what he's, uh, his inference is here as well. 
Well, Bert, I, I um, have a friend in Virginia, and a couple of times he's gotten to run in the Boston Marathon. And there's all these pictures, uh, and he's got a picture when the starting gun goes off and this this throng of humanity. And he said, look at that little dot in that crowd. That's me in there. And then there's a picture of him crossing the finish line. Now, at the start of the Boston Marathon, it's just thousands of people. But crossing the finish line, there's just one here, one there. And I asked him one time, I said, well, now, where is everybody? He said, well, you know, one by one, they just fall out of the race. Yeah. And that, that tragically happens in the Christian life. Friend, purpose in your heart with the help of God that you're going to complete the race God set in front of you. It's what Paul said, I have finished the race. I've run that course. And so that's, I want it to be said of all of those who are listening to us. Look at verse 8 real quickly. We're coming close to the end of this uh, segment. Oh, this is big. The high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. Now, here it is. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. Mm -hmm. What a statement. But that's not the end of it. I mean, that's a good one. But listen to verse 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I'll remove the iniquity of that land in in one day. The mm -hmm. stone and the branch. Alex, uh, that yeah. sounds familiar to me as pictures of the Messiah, Jesus. Well, well, let me say, in Isaiah 4, the coming Messiah is called the branch. In Jeremiah 23, in Jeremiah 33, so several times, four times in the Old Testament, the coming Messiah is called the branch. And the branch, think of a, a, a branch that's connected to a plant or a tree that's bearing its fruit and is full of life. And uh, listen, you want to be connected to the branch and have life in you as well. But this is one of the names of the coming Savior, and it's used several times in the Old Testament. And, you know, uh, nine is a reference to... Uh, April of, uh, some think April 6, 30 A.D., I will remove their iniquity in one day. Um, it, Max Licato has a book, Six Hours, One Friday. You remember mm, that book, I do. Bert? Yes. Listen, the, the sins of a human race, a fallen humanity, paid for in one day. Mm. We're talking about Jesus. Uh, he's the centerpiece of what we do here on Exploring the Word. Uh, we open the Bible and make a beeline for Jesus, and we hope that's what you'll do in your life. You're listening to Exploring the Word on AFR Talk, Bert Harper, Alex McFarland. We'll be back in two minutes, and we'll give you that phone number so you can call us with your questions and your comments. <laughs> 